What is up, you guys? We're back with another live stream, but this time we're on the Academy channel because we're going to talk about design. I have an amazing guest that's lined up and ready to talk to us. But just for one second, I want to say what's up, Donuts, Futurists, Future Roddy, Future Fam. We got Stefan Kuntz on the show with us today. And if you don't know who he is, you will know him in one second. There's a good chance you're already following him on Insta Grizzle. He's a letterer, designer, illustrator, typographer. He's got this signature style that he calls Typo X Photo. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And a term that he's using called Wordscapes. Hand lettering art integrated into unique landscapes. And his, his about page needs to be updated because last checked, he's got 379,000 plus followers Ooh. on Instagram. Oh my yeah. God. Mm. Beast mode right there. <laughs> He's worked with Asics, Adobe, and Apple. Those are just the A's, okay? Coca-Cola, Unsplash, <laughs> Nokia, Hallmark, Microsoft, and a ton of other people. He's born in Zurich, and he may be returning there soon, but he's based out of Australia right now. If you guys go check out his Instagram, it's Stefan Kunz, K-U-N-Z. You can check out all his work. He posts very frequently, uh, and you can see all this wonderful hand-lettered goodness. Here's some of his work. I believe this is, and we'll find out from Stefan in a second, in his home. And I see these things, and I, I'm just imagining to myself, he erases them and then does it, does another one. Hmm. And that, like, when we have one of these things made, we leave it up for years. <laughs> and he's just tearing it down and do another one. Right, Matthew? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Our chalk wall, made by five those. interns. <laughs> <laughs> so this is part of his wordscapes, doing his hand lettering in environments. Wow. I hope this is your notebook, Stefan, but we'll find out. And the internet sometimes can lead you wrong. And this is going to speak directly to Mr. Ben Burns. But first, coffee. <laughs> and then create something today, even if it sucks. Mm. And he has a book out, you guys. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So now you guys must be falling in love with Stefan. He's I young. I am. He's talented. <laughs> He's good looking. <laughs> He's prolific. He's got a big social following. What is there not to like about this guy? Let's try and find something we can hate on. We'll work on that, right? He also makes tools for creative people. Brushes. Look at this. For Procreate. That simu simulate Ooh. paint markers. Oh, nice. That That's pretty legit. cool. It is very legit. So, you know what? Instead of just us looking at static images, why don't we watch the video? Jonah. Hey legends, welcome to my YouTube channel. If you want to see a little bit more of this. Or this. Why don't you hit that subscribe button so you won't miss what's coming up. <laughs> what happened there? So, without further ado, Stefan, welcome to the show. Yeah, Woo! there he is. God, I just don't like you already. I just don't like you. Got the good hair. He's young. He's talented. He's making money. He's doing big things in the world. Welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Thank you, Chris. Good. I'm good. I'm sitting here in the morning in Australia with my morning coffee, <laughs> and uh, gotta say. There's nothing better to do than to talk to you on a rainy day. <laughs> you know, you look super chill right now. You're like relaxed oh, and you got I the big comfy chair and you got the nice mic. Fun, funny story, my chair is being sold in a couple of hours. So somebody is going to pick it up in a couple of hours and then I won't have it. So I'm enjoying that last time in that beautiful, comfortable chair with you. And with <laughs> so your why are you selling your chair? Because I, I'm leaving the country uh, in about a week, and so everything has to go. And I hate selling stuff. I hate taking care of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's all the good and the thing that you have to get when, you're, like, when you get to the next location. Find everything else. And so I'm selling everything. Wow. Okay, so what brought you to Australia? Where, whereabouts in Australia are you? I'm in Sydney, Australia. It's mm -hmm. uh, the East Coast and uh, where the sun goes up. And I, I've been here like six years before and I felt that was the right time to, to move or to go there. Um, I've been here like on, on visits only, so I've not been working from here, but just been, been traveling around. And yeah, it, it helped definitely get my uh, mileage status a lot faster because you travel like 15 hours to the US or 24 hours to Europe. Mm -hmm. So do you travel a lot? 
I do. I do a lot of, um, I love doing like commission pieces, mm -hmm. uh, commission work. And, and so I get to travel a lot or all around doing conferences, doing, um, doing live art. So for, for example, I've been in, in Sweden, well, Switzerland as well, um, in the States and, and all around just doing pieces everywhere where I can. And I love traveling as well. Mm -hmm. Are big clients hiring you to do murals for them? Is that what we're talking about here? Um, all kinds. So from from workshops to um, to murals to like individual pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been getting into to murals more. So what you are wanting to do more, like that's kind of what you should focus on on getting. And and so with with the chalk art that I do, people see that I do large scale things, even if it has nothing to do with murals. Um, they see large scale and they translate that to, oh, this actually could cool on our wall. And and since what I love to do is encouraging people and through my my Instagram posts, um, they often come out to me and ask me to do the same thing for them. I see. I got a lot of questions for you. I just want to make sure everybody that's watching live on YouTube, get your comments in. Matthew's joining us for this live stream. He'll be monitoring your questions and asking it at the appropriate time. There he is with his double eyebrow pump. <laughs> That's my signature. The classic. The classic. Now, I got a question for you. So there's probably a lot of people in our audience who really admire the kinds of things you do, even if they don't know who you are. It, it's a dream. I mean, what you do looks really beautiful. It's very engaging. So let's just talk a bit about business a little bit. How do you make a living doing what it is that you do? So if we look back on 2018, either in percentages or however you want to talk about whatever you're comfortable with, how do you make a living? Where does the money come from? And give us a sense of the scope and scale and the kinds of things you do, please. All right. So, um, last year I've, I've had like five different income streams. Okay. And number one was, uh, actually the shop. It overtook what I did with, uh, with client work mm -hmm. and client work was basically, um, maybe 40, 40, and then the rest is is like uh, speaking engagements, Instagram posts, so paid promotions, um, and what else? Um, and now, like something that I started new is like coaching sessions. It's something that I, I just see. like. It's not about the money that I'm 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 doing that. It's more about like how can I help people and how can I do it? And time is valuable. So and as you know, like you you want to charge people so they also feel the value of what they're getting. Um, because if it's free advice, it's free advice. It has no value or not the same value. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's kind of where kind of like going with the knowledge, the consulting knowledge of, of even how to ramp up your Instagram business, how to, how to promote something better. I see that usually, uh, companies come to me with, with an ask for maybe to promote something and they just want to get like a feed post or Instagram story. And they kind of forget that, um, I actually like if they tell me what they want or what they want to achieve, I'd love to help them more achieve that goal instead of just, well, you just pay for a feed post or Instagram post, mm -hmm. Instagram story post. But yeah, so, so that's kind of something that's ramping up new, but definitely last year it was client work. Um, it was the, the, the shop and, and then just, yeah, some paid promotions, uh, speaking engagements and workshops. Beautiful. So you said that online now, courses. what's that? I, I also said do online courses. I, I didn't, mm -hmm. there is nothing new coming out last year, but I recorded one last year and it's coming out, uh, this following month. It's all about social media and how to grow on social media or build up your presence on social media. Perfect. Cause I want to ask you about that too. So I don't know how comfortable you are, and I'm, I, I can't be me if I, on a, the channel that talks about the business of design and speaking to artists. I'm just curious, when you do client work, what is it and what are the general ballpark ranges of prices that you would charge to, like if I wanted to hire Stefan to do something for me, what kind of assignment would it be and how much would you, in the ballpark of like, what would you charge? Yeah, so I said myself, um, uh, a floor number that I just, I don't do below. So mm -hmm. at the moment it's around $2,800, $3,000. That's where I, I'll start considering a project. Okay. Uh, and, and it can be a poster. It can be something easy. So, so usually I don't do small stuff. I don't do the quick uh, stuff where people just say like, Oh, I want a quick logo or I want to, 
I don't know, a, a just a sign. Like, it will take you like 10 minutes. I know it will take me 10 minutes or five minutes even, but I'm starting at that price point. If you want that at that price point, I'm happy to give that to you. Right. So that's kind of how I structured it. And then it, it, it develops over um, to, like if it's a big company, it's like usage rights, and that's mm -hmm. kind of how you can you can talk about your pricing further. So, um, say for example, if if I'm doing something for uh, Microsoft and and they want to to promote it, but they just don't want to keep it in one country, they want to sell it in other countries as well. Then you can go in and like, all right, well, you want probably the usage rights for all of these countries, and so on, and like. Pricing last year went everything from from like 2K uh, to what was probably the biggest number that I had was like 45, wow. uh, 50,000 for projects, uh -huh. which was it, it was a campaign, a key visual for for the airport. Mm -hmm. um, that was the biggest client project that I've done, and and it was special because it's also I I did it through. Like I did a one to one, so I had no agents um, in in between. I had no agency um, that that looked through the whole thing, and and yes, yeah, so it's it's directly uh, B to C or B to B, like my business to their business. Right. So you did a campaign at the airport. Is this a, a like a live painting, a mural that you painted? So what I did, they they came to me and they asked me for a. Um, a visual campaign for their summer uh, campaign, and and then suddenly it turned into not just being a visual, but like it's it's um, it will be over everything. Like they had like mega poster, like like over when you're driving to to the parking lot, there's like a massive poster. Uh, it's the biggest size that I've ever seen my work on, and and then they had inside they had on on pretty much everything from. From aprons that the chefs were cooking in in the restaurants, they had like the the visual, um, and it just said like "best of Switzerland" with kind of a gray background, and it all like typescape. So it's it's um, it's actually the Matterhorn, um, but written with every kind of word that describes Switzerland or what's best of Switzerland, like chocolate, uh, cheese, mm -hmm. and all these things. And and my brother actually helped me with his company to to visualize that in in uh, the video form. So he animated everything, um, or had everything animated, and that was playing in the duty free stores. Um, you could see like uh, like stands and booths everywhere in the airport, and that work was pretty much everywhere, even in the newspaper that uh, they distribute on on Swiss Airlines um, there. Was this the the airport, the client contacted you directly, or was there an agency who found you and said, we would like for you to do this for us? So that was that was a funny story. It's uh, somebody just reached out to me and sent me an email through my website and like the, the form that I, I get people to, to, to submit to. Mm -hmm. and, and they just reached out and just said, like, we, I have someone who recommended you to us. And... And there was something special because she didn't have a supervisor at the time. So she was responsible, but didn't have a supervising role um, and in their own marketing department. And so she was young and she was willing to, to, to go for something creative, kind of better. Mm -hmm. um, and what I didn't know about was that she had to sell that to her uh, superiors, like one level above them and who would approve the project. And so when I pitched it, she kind of came back to me a couple of times just because she liked what I did and she wanted that to, to be the campaign. Um, so I was in, they like big companies have to pitch, have to, uh, other companies to pitch in as well, just so they can make a selection, even if they like you really right. uh, much. And, and so I had to pitch against two agencies. Um, and again, I've never done that before. I was like, I had this stupid uh, confidence of, yes, I can do this. I, I'm totally ready for this job. But while I was really ne not prepared at all, and once I got the project and once we started, I was like really seeing that I was totally out of my depth because mm. like an agency would have project managers, have people that will actually like know, like create the content, creative directors, designers, and all this team. And I was just like everything myself. And I had to come up with, with what I was about to do or how to come up with all these uh, things myself. And luckily enough, she, um, the, the woman from, 
and uh, her name is Ava. She um, she was smart enough to to see that I was struggling a bit, and and so she helped me through that process um, make it happen. So together we were actually an amazing team, and even um, while I was here in Australia, we had like time zone differences, um, and so communicating was hard with the between eight and ten hour time difference. Um, so what was great about that was actually that I could work through the night, send them everything over, and then in the morning she had everything, she could work through it, uh, get it um, approved or not, and then send it back. So when we were on a time crunch, we just made that happen and made it happen fast. Wow. But I got the job pretty much because somebody recommended me to her, and she didn't follow me. Like They didn't care about my Instagram. They didn't care about what I did there. So I was like, I was under impression like, hey, I'm big on Instagram, so that's kind of why you want me. <laughs> when it came, when it came to, uh, and it's kind of a foolish thing you to do, like basing your um, your value on your numbers. And and what I learned is is yeah, definitely didn't have anything to do. And when I pitched like, hey, I can do a live drawing, they're like, yeah, well, we cannot pay you for this. Like, but I'm, I'm I have this huge following. It's like. Yeah, that's not why we actually hired you. Like, <laughs> hired you. So, you love your style and and all that. Like the airport is is a big company. It's 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 a well known company here in Switzerland, and and so if if you were a respected artist, that's kind of how she phrased it. Um, <laughs> not, 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 not nothing hurtful intended, but right. it was just it was for me. It was an awakening of like, oh, you know what? I don't. I need to take myself less serious and less um, take myself on. Like, I'm I'm a like a beginner artist. I'm I'm still going into it. I've I've been doing this for maybe three four years. Like business wise, I've been doing this for three years. Um, it took off in 2017, so not even that long. And and so that's you you realize you don't have to to take yourself too seriously sometimes yeah it sounded like in your telling of the story there was like perfect synchronicity happening on your behalf despite yourself this young girl and if she was more senior maybe it wouldn't have worked out and she connected with you for a number of different reasons and she helped you along the process you were in like you said out of your depth or out of your league or whatever because there were agencies pitching or bidding against you and you didn't even know how to do that and then you land the largest job of your career so far, as as far as commission is concerned. I mean, that's just that's an amazing story, and it seems like you you've got the right perspective, and you learn so much from this experience to say like, yes, in some some areas I need to grow, some areas, and some areas I, I just need to realize I'm just beginning on my creative journey, despite the fact that I have this large internet following, right? Because prior yeah. to that, I'm pretty sure most people find you because of your large following. You're like, yeah, I'm that guy. Yeah, I got you. And then they're like, uh, who? No, we just like your work. And this is a big deal, so we can't be messing around with live drawings and all that kind of stuff. So that was just kind of a little wake-up call, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was definitely something strange and new for me, mm -hmm. just going through that and seeing, well, I'm, I'm really out of my depth. And But yeah, you learn so much more. If I, if I would have gone with what I know, I definitely would have taken that. Um, and that happened so many times last in the last two years where I've just said yes to things and, and then realized like, what, what am I doing? I have no clue what I'm doing. I sold myself and, and I, I got the job, but now what? Right now I'm, 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 I'm getting nervous and anxious and, and, but then you realize like, just take one step at a time and it's incredible what you can do and what you can learn while you're doing it. Yep. And it's a lot better than if you learn it by things watching someone else do it first and then you do it right it's you're doing on the job training while getting paid which is the best way to do it so i have so many questions just on this one story alone how did you know how much to charge and did you feel at that time when you submitted the number that it was going to be too much or am i worth it do you, do you go through that whole process that many creative people do definitely do yes so mm -hmm. the um the hardest part is is knowing are you pitching in too low or too high? Right. And if you're if you're too low, like you know, the answer you're gonna get is like, yes, we'll take it. Uh, it's like they, they they won't wait for the reply. They don't even have to ask their supervisors for yes. Um, you know, it's it's good, or you're maximizing out what you're getting when when they are like, mm, I'll, I'll have to talk and I have to do. And you know you've pitched too high when when's the clear no? It's like sorry, we cannot afford that. Right. And 
and it's interesting. Like I've always seen the the um, the pricing uh, system as there are people who are willing to pay for something. Like if you're rich, then you don't care about money that much. Like value is something that is what is value to you. And and I've seen that in the wedding photography industry. I've I've been a wedding photographer before, and and I've learned so much because you can sell yourself as a wedding photographer for fifteen thousand uh, a day or for two thousands. A lot of people will opt for two thousand because they'll get jobs for two thousands. But there are people who are willing to pay fifteen grand for a wedding photographer or more. And it doesn't mean they're any they're anything better. They're just they're able to find clients that are willing to pay that much and mm -hmm. who value their work for that much. And so I've seen that for myself as well as a lettering artist. Like for some people, like if, if I would design you a tattoo for 2000 bucks, it's like, it's, that's insane. I would not pay that for myself. Um, and like, I wouldn't pay necessarily my prices for myself, but for other people, for clients, like bigger corporation, that's the value that you have for them. Like for Coca-Cola, um, a post on Instagram and, and something that they can use on Times Square, like that's, that has value to them. And a lot more than maybe the the startup that is just starting out, and so when I go into pricing, and especially here for the for the airport project, it was something I've never done before, and it's it's usually asking a lot of questions in the beginning, asking everything you can to figure out what you are um, like, what you're getting yourself into, and then also set the prices right that they don't cannot add work without you just like, oh, I, I didn't know about that. Now I have to do that too. So that's kind of how the price grew. It doubled actually in budget because um, she didn't know half of the, the the formats that will be used. Like there were all of these videos that would be used. There was this mega post that would come in. There were all these different uh, canvas sizes that they wanted. And my design, luckily for me, was not flexible in, in, the, in the formats. So, because words were drawn everywhere and they didn't want to cut out words. So it ended up like, we'll have to scale it and you have to draw in additional words. If you see the piece, um, it's somewhere on my Instagram and definitely on my homepage. Um, it's, it's, it's nice because like that format didn't apply to anything and you had a little bit of wiggle room, but not that much. And so I had to redraw every format and that's how my budget increased over time. But when I put out, I just went through the steps, like how much like administration fees, like the, the email back and forth will be huge on, on this project. So I want to make sure that that's kind of covered. Um, all the sketches that I'm doing, how many revisions round do I, do I want to make and how many, like how, how much am I comfortable with doing something and, and so forth. And that has helped me um, figure out the price and kind of go back and forth with them. And then in the end, it was more like buyout rights. Um, that was a huge part. Like it's it's something I, as as someone who has not studied design or 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 worked in an agency or something like that, um, buyout rights is something very strange and where you didn't know that there is actually money to be made, where you can actually set it off. And so now they can use that campaign every every year, and I'm not getting a penny for that because they buy, bought the rights. But for the project, I got a lot, so right. it's it pays out somewhere. You factored in the usage as part of your price. So, do you have a rule yeah. of thumb in terms of like here's the base price, and if they ask for a global buyout, I mean they they pretty much own it, it's work for hire at that point. Then, is there a percentage that you'd like to go with and ask for on top of the base fee? Um, so I did because I knew it was national, they didn't want international. They just wanted like unlimited uh, amount of time. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I just looked over the price and, and looked kind of what feels right. If I ask double the price, like triple the price, um, like multiplied it by two and, and said like, that's that's the additional for the buyout. Then I, I just felt like looking at the number, um, I just didn't feel right about it. So I'm, I, I could say I'm a very emotional pricing person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going after what feels right and how do I, if I'm the client, how do I look at the number and can justify that or not? And and so all the buyouts on this project were about like a 50 or 100% of the design work on top of that. And and then, and that's where we, we had discussion room where like, 
can you reduce or can we do the full buyout for this set price and not like add on top? And so at the end, I, I actually had to cut budget from from the buyout, but like the whole design price was was included. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end, I, I still felt great about it. It's just more that as soon as you have a number set in your head, you're like, you kind of want to see that number come in. But at the end, it was like, well, we have discussed that here and here and here and here. And, and so we, there was a little bit of back and forth. And since I valued the work that I was able to do for them, I valued them. Um, I, I, I was like happy to, to cut off a little chunk of, of the buyout in the end. Mm. I have to ask you this question. It's not for me, but it's from our audience who are going to be watching this and either live or later on. They're going to say, but wait a minute. Do you feel guilty for charging a client who could afford more? more for the work than a client who could afford less. Isn't that unethical? I don't feel this way, but I'm going to ask you to see how you respond. Yeah. I, I know you don't feel this way. I don't feel this way either. It's, um, it's, it's a good question to ask. It's you, you feel like, like, can I, like, can I change my prices? And like, they're, they're companies who, who your work for them is more valuable for them than it is for a startup. Um, you said that in, in, a, uh, in your probably most popular video. It's like, if I do a logo for Coca-Cola, like that logo will be everywhere on every bottle, everything. Mm -hmm. And so messing that up is, is a huge part of the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a risk involved as well. And in talking about like wedding photography, like I would say, like there's, you definitely have a chance to mess things up, but uh, both people will do a work and about similar in, in like in design, like same thing, like you buy a Rolex or you buy a, a super expensive watch. Like I don't, I don't tell you, you have to buy that. Like if, if I would tell you, you need to buy it, like if it's water, it's something that you need to live and I would price it just higher for you than for someone else, that would, that would be unethical. But if it's a product that you can choose from, um, you don't have to work with me. If you want to work with me, that's my price. And so that's where I feel um, you can change that around. And, and still for me, it's, it's, it's about how do I feel about the price? And like for the project for Coca-Cola, I didn't actually pitch the price. I asked for their budget. Um, when I was on the phone with them and they just said like, this is our budget. And, and funny enough, I would have, I would have gone below that way right. below that. And, and the best part is when they came back with me to, with their, their contract, I was reading through it and it's like, you know what? I should ask for more. <laughs> and, and even though I, I, I had a really great deal, I just wanted to take that. And, uh, I just, I just saw that suddenly they, they asked what they were asking me for was was everything. Plus, they had the rights to to use the picture in any way they want. So right. I feel when it comes to pricing, asking the person as many questions as you can, like why are you including this in the contract? Why are why do you want this right? Why do you want to have exclusive right for everything? Um, why do I have have an exclusivity um, like uh, clause in in the contract? And so. Um, this is something that I, that I've seen, um, helped me a lot. Hold on, hold on. Something happened. Jonah, what are you doing? It exited out for whatever reason. Did we lose? No, okay. we're there. We're there. We're still there. Yeah, yeah. Jonah's trying to show people's secret okay. emails or something like Jonah. Just, I didn't even touch it. It just okay. went back to it. All right. All right. Keep going. Sorry about he, that. He's, he's in my Gmail. He's in my <laughs> Gmail. <laughs> we're trying to figure out your Coca-Cola <laughs> client right now. So don't worry. Don't worry. We're exactly. hacking you this instance. Um, yeah, but but exactly for that, like um, only through asking questions, I realized that they wanted to put that ad or to put that uh, design on Times Square. And thanks to that, I, I was able to like, all right, well, you know, if you want to put that on Times Square, that's worth something. Um, so I asked for more and we found ours uh, together in like halfway. And and so it's like it's it's kind of stupid if you're asking for more money for something that you're already getting more than you thought you would get. But at the same time, it's like, it's also just basic uh, negotiating skills. It's like trying to get the best deal you can for yourself. Mm -hmm. And and then you as, as a 
as a designer, as a creative, like how can you give your client the best value for what they paid for? Um, so it goes both ways. It's like, it's unethical if you think about like, I'm just getting more and I don't have to do, like you don't have to do more. Your design work is not gonna improve by that much. But it's it's like, how can I like do my best on this project and, and be the best client or best creative they've ever hired? And, and so that's a relationship you're going to start building. Right. Okay. We got a lot of questions coming in. I just want to say hello to everybody, especially people tuning in from Nigeria. Some people are saying like, I'm up really late. 1024. Boo hoo. 1024 is not up really late. Come on. <laughs> Come on. If you can't stay up late, late to watch this channel and get some information from stuff on and see how this guy who I believe is self-taught and somewhat new to the, the world of design, how he's able to charge not just thousands, but tens of thousands for his work and he's sharing very openly. So I do appreciate that. Okay. So you said you have not been doing this for very long and you have not gone to school for this. What the heck did you go to school for and how the, how does one become Stefan and be such an amazing artist and lettering? <laughs> so give us the secret, man. What's up? So I was always interested in design and I love designing. Um, yeah. Like just drawing, doing creative stuff. I, I did first to start out with photography, uh, with vi videography, then went into photography, and then um, like I, I had a job in banking, so that's kind of what I learned. Like I have a diploma in banking, so Swiss banker. Um, <laughs> Is that what all the kids and, study in Switzerland, like banking? <laughs> well, you, you pretty much think so, but it's, you do it's, feel like uh, that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge uh, job in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I learned so much from, from that, just doing uh, banking, just learning on the job. like client interaction, like being a teller, just um, like taking people money in, giving them money out, <laughs> having that one to one, talking with like high net worth clients yeah. and, and then talking about their finances, how like how they invest their money. It's mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Um, trying to sell people credit cards, like one, one of the, the, the things you have to do as, as a banker is like either sell them on funds uh, or, or credit cards and but the first lesson you'll learn is like don't sell them anything they don't want like if if they're not going to be happy with it then you're just selling them something bad and and even if your uh, corporation requires you to get some numbers um you will always be better off selling them things that they want and that you can help them with and not something that like it's not going to be useful for them so that's kind of the first thing that I've learned there um, and I've applied to to whatever I do. Like I'm not going to sell you anything you don't want and I'm going to try to like if, if it's not a fit between the client and me, I'm not going to take it. Like it's it's I'm better off not taking what's um, what they don't want. And I think you said that too. It's if I can find someone better for the job then or like if, if they come back with references of, of some of my friends. I, I won't take the job because I'm like, just ask that person. They'll do this job that you want. Um, and so it's you, you're better off that way. And you learn so much from from different from different jobs. Like I've learned so much from banking. I've learned so much from wedding photography, um, from from different industries that I just been into, and and that has helped me be the person who I am today and doing business the way I do it today. Mm. And and so yeah. Well, let's let's uh, enough about the banking already, you Swiss boy. You, how about the lettering? How did you do learn to do the lettering stuff? So that was really funny. I one day I just looked over my Instagram. Um, it was a period where I was sick for for a couple of months. I was laid off from work for two months, um, and and I looked over my Instagram and I just saw like this is just random stuff that I'm posting and there's nothing there. So one day I decided like, all right, let's, let's change that. Let's actually post something like more consistent, more with value. Um, and at the time my value was not that much, but it's, it's like, I, I posted a picture of a Lego reindeer, like those miniature Legos mm -hmm. and, and like had a, an app that would have, have like these graphic templates that you can just put over and you just have to change the text and, and added that into, um, into my iPhone. And then it grew into like I use an app called Over, use that for text editing and and creating, and and then it kind of like gradually evolved into to more steps um, to suddenly where this app couldn't 
allow me to to improve anymore. So I was stuck with what the app allowed me to do. I've used every function that they that they uh, enabled me to do, and so I decided to start drawing. And that was 2014, and I had no idea that lettering was one was a job and was something that people did for a living. Um, I just did it, and and my account grew a little bit, like it was at a thousand. Um, but then I, I I was always very competitive. So a friend of mine was always a little bit ahead of me, and he was in photography, really good photographer. And so I I didn't tell him, but I was shadowing him or trying to beat him just a couple followers more than he had. <laughs> and when I met him um, here in Australia, actually. I, I told them, you know what, I'm always trying to beat you and always be ahead, like a couple of followers, like 10 followers ahead of you. And so he said, like, why not do a game out of this? Like, let's see who gets to 5,000 first. And for me, that was like, whoa, from one and a half thousand to 5,000, that's a major step. And and so, but I was like, challenge taken, I'm on and I'll beat you. Um, and... And so he had like, he was married, he was doing us, he was studying, he was working on the side and it's like, I'm, I'm single, I have a, a banking job that doesn't use so much of my, my, um, my time or like energy. So I have a lot of energy and I have time to do that. And so I was racing and in one month or so I had grown from one, one and a half thousand to five thousand. And then it was another slow, slow time to 10, 15,000. I started a, a challenge called the 100 Day Creative Challenge, where it's like every day doing something with type. And so I decided back then, like, all right, typography is my thing. That's what I'm going to stick with. Um, and at the time, I really didn't want to do any client work. I didn't want to do that as a job because I just didn't know how to do client work right. And I always had this problem that I sold my, my, my project as, as a full project not on an hourly rate. And, and so, and I just said like, to kind of like uh, client satisfaction. And, and when they came back with revisions and round of revisions, and if you don't say that clearly, like you have two rounds of revisions, um, then they'll come back and their communication will, will de uh, degrade. And because they're just like, oh, I can send him an email now. And, and then if I find something else, I'll can send that again. And so I hated that part. Uh, until I, I saw some other designers that I wanted to hire to create a logo for me. I saw, I read through their, um, their contracts and their agreements. And I saw that was clearly stated, like you have two uh, revision rounds. And that helped me so much in that space to, to grow and to, to go forward. So um, when I heard that, I actually changed that around and suddenly client work became easier and a lot uh, better. And at the same time, I was like growing my Instagram um, I had it around 20, 25,000, um, because I was pumping out work every day. And so a lot of people were talking about my challenge that I was doing. They were like, Oh, you should check out this guy. Like he's doing this hundred day creative challenge. Um, and, and then at the beginning of the year, I saw, I saw, um, that, um, that my account was growing about 200, uh, followers a day. And, and so that moment I did what uh, every banker does is like open spreadsheet, um, like count down, like how much, like how much uh, followers would you accumulate over a year every day if you gain 200 a day. So I learned that around 20, 30,000, at the end of the year, you would reach uh, 100,000. So suddenly this was a huge milestone that I envisioned. And I'm like, I have a goal now. That's what I want to reach. And to achieve that, I had to get better with, with what I did, with what I created. So growing on Instagram meant also growing my skills and that helped kind of build that uh, milestone. And so ever since it was always like, I gotta get better with what I do because I gotta, like, I gotta impress people. I gotta keep people interested and not leaving. Like if I do the same thing over and over again, like I can grow fast for one time, but not grow uh, continually. And I've grown pretty much every year since then, like a hundred thousand. I've always hit the hundred thousand mark um, ever since. Wow! So, and this year, I'm, I'm way ahead of the curve. Beautiful. Look, there's somebody in our chat right now. Her name is Jana Vire, and she says, "I've been following Stefan for a while now, and I'm so proud to see how far he's come." Also, my two worlds are colliding is a dream. Mm -hmm. Stefan in the future, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Matthew. This is awesome. Matthew, some questions maybe. Yeah, there's there's a lot of questions. I'm All gonna right. pull them up, but I want to make a interesting 
observation about Stefan. What I've heard and just hearing your story, the thing that I like about you and, and I could relate to this a little bit is that it seems like you just put yourself into new situations and you're a sponge. So whatever situation you go in, you look and you're curious, you're observant and you learn from that very quickly and you apply it very quickly. So I think that's why over three years, you're able to grow so quickly, both on your Instagram and your how much you're charging professionally, like how you practice. It seems like you're able to take all these different things because you have that open mind, that curiosity, and you're willing to apply it right away without hesitation. So I want to say kudos to you for that because that's very amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Also, what's up, Denmark? What's up, Canada? <laughs> I was going to say Toronto, but it's not Toronto. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Uh, Matthew, what are the questions? So there's one here from uh, Kristen Mc McMaster, and she asks, my question for Stefan is, did you have nice handwriting growing up? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Come on, he's Swiss. That is a good one. That, Come on, man. That is a common, that is a common um, thing that people think about. Yeah. I actually did have a nice handwriting. So I <laughs> love handwriting. And I, I love writing, but that has nothing to do with lettering. So that's it, it, it's kind of bad that I actually do have a nice handwriting. But a lot of my friends who are lettering artists, they don't have a nice handwriting. That's the thing why doctors have a bad handwriting is because they don't like apply it themselves and they, they just write really, really fast. And if I, if I would write really, really fast, I wouldn't have that much, like it would still be legible, but it would still be like, it would be more wonky. And I think that's a big misconception though. Uh, nevertheless, um, that yeah, that people who do lettering have a nice handwriting. Of course, I know how to to draw like a beautiful S and I can apply that into to whatever I write and do it easy and like make it look effortlessly. But that comes through a lot of practice as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to ask you this question. Since you learned how to do hand lettering and you're very good at it, now do you go back and write notes with the same kind of precision or is there a I'm a lettering artist m mindset and then there's I'm just a regular dude. I'm just going to write this real quick. So definitely. So when I take notes, um, like... Let me just hold up your notepad. Yeah, sheet. let's do this. Let's put this issue to bed. It's like everybody thinks, oh, you're a graphic designer. You must be able to draw. And lettering, I think, is like a learned skill that you draw forms and you, you're good at drafting. And if you're good at drawing cars, it doesn't mean you have a nice hand lettering. Just because you're good at figurative drawing doesn't mean you're good. At, you have a good hand. We can't really see. It. Can you guys see that? Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty okay. good. That's pretty clean. Yeah. But it's not like <laughs> his chalkboard drawings. No, it's not crazy right? decorative. No, it's definitely not. Definitely right. not. And and like I can apply myself. It's it's always a question of how much time do you have right. and do you really want to do it? Like like the poster um you guys have in the background with the what sleeper but um a heavy light sleeper, uh, yeah, yep. yeah, but not a heavy dreamer. Like if if I would if I would draw that D like that, like I can do that, but it's easier to draw a D like when you're writing something like if I would be writing dreaming, like I would wouldn't write that D in that same style. Right. It just takes up too much time. Mm -hmm. exactly. So there's one, it, I guess it's, it's really around the intent. Am I, am I making a piece of art or am I just communicating and I just need to get my notes down? That's really all it is, right? To capture my thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, good. So hello, Malaysia. What, it, uh, what other kind of questions we got, Matthew? There's a bunch of questions uh, circling process. And I was wondering maybe if you could walk us through that because people are asking, do you start analog or digital? How do you come up with your concepts? And, um, you know, like how, how, where do you begin? And maybe if you could illuminate some of those steps. The good old process question. Yeah. All right. So the good old process question <laughs> starts definitely that my process changes every time. Um, if my process would stay the same, I definitely, I feel like it would be easier just to have like a formula. But what I've realized, it's, it's graphic design, designing in general, it's always about problem solving. Mm -hmm. So you're always like, like you start off with like, how can I design this quote? Or how can I design like, what, what does the client want? And, or what do I want to create? And how do I start? And, and then you start off with ideas, like you, you pitch them down, you write them down. And whatever is easiest for you, it's like, usually it's pen on paper. Sometimes it's even, uh, it's drawing on the iPad. Whatever you have around you, that's kind of what you get. And I like to switch around between iPad, between paper, mm -hmm. uh, sketchbooks and all that. And then I, but mostly before even I start doing that, I, I often think about how in my head, how I can visualize it. So 
I'm a very visual person, so I'll always visualize how it will look in real life mm. and how it can does does that actually work? Like that piece that you're just showing there, the together. Mm-hmm. Um, like I already saw the people standing in there, like the the people around and with the shadow. I didn't know about the design, how how far it would go, but I kind of saw the person, and so I'm like, all right, the circle is, is important. How can I do that? And and how can I mix that up? And 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 then for that one, I yeah, I <laughs> the story behind this one is actually really funny. I I was procrastinating all day long till about 3 p.m. and um, the sun was setting about 4 or 5 p.m. and I and I wanted to go for a run and or or do something like like active and then finally ended up like sitting down and starting sketching this out and and I like I was already in in the zone I kept on going and suddenly I realized like all right now it's too late to go out I just keep on going and I procrastinated all day long and then suddenly like start working on this piece and and work till like from 3 p.m. till 4 p.m. in the morning. And really when I was exhausted, I, I just like, all right, I got to stop here because I'm not making any progress anymore. I'm just circling around. I'm not happy with the colors. I'm not happy with how it looks. And like I've missed my posting time. And that's kind of the Instagram way of saying I've missed my deadline. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go to the next deadline. Um, and so I, I, I slept a couple of hours woke up again and then kept on working and then trying out different colors. Um, and then, yeah, then asked all my, my followers for, for pictures of, of their feet. So those are mm. actually uh, pictures of my followers' feet um, to, to bring it all together. And, and that's kind of a cool integration with your community, how to get your community to engage with you. Mm. So there are like um, four or five people and then there's like one uh, top left is this uh, photo of a like from Unsplash um, that I use as well. Mm. But yeah, so so you start um, visualizing everything in your head, and you start thinking of how can you bring that together. But then you're sketching out, and then comes like then the path actually starts to change because what you think was like oh I'm just going from A to B suddenly becomes like a divergent, and you circle around things, you go there, and like you sketch this out, um, you have different options, and then you just choose like which one is the best option that I can c- go on with. Like if if you're working for a client, it's definitely going to be him deciding whether or not which piece he wants to c- keep on going. Right. And so the process keeps on changing. And for example, the last piece of chalk that I did, the home is where the pants aren't. There's like I wanted to do something on the chalk wall, um, and it started off with the idea like home is where the chalk wall is then moved into like home is where the <laughs> pants aren't uh, because it was just funny of I, I had that idea of like holding the the pants up and making that an a that was a perfect shape for it and then when i was starting designing i'm like oh i have no idea like composition wise how to make it interesting and and so i just drew these two lines like the upper and and lower line of the pants and and kind of that slanted um that up slanted uh, line and that became like the the center and then then becomes like that problem solving um okay where do i put the next words and like oh is where balances out beautifully um and so you go from there and you you just keep on going and then suddenly it turned out like i think it turned out great there's a lot of things i would change uh like the aren't i would change that um it's it's not as nice or not as structured as the home um so i might have changed the style of aren't into the same style that mm-hmm. were and and stuff like that and hey, definitely the inside of the pants is is something that i've still been working on who took that photo for you um my housemate did okay so, so you have somebody that I, documents you while you do your work well no i w- while i'm working i definitely have like a camera that just films me uh, i've just have a tripod that mm-hmm. i use um but when i um when i when i finish the work if, if there's someone around, I'll definitely um, use use that person. Uh, but if I have no one around, I'll just use a tripod and a timer. Like I see. there, there's some that I did with with the uh, with the phone as a trigger. Mm-hmm. So you have like an app that you can connect to your camera, and then you can just use it to trigger. Mm-hmm. And he did all of this in his without, boxers without his <laughs> yeah, pants. Without the you should have done it naked, dude. Come on, <laughs> you're, you're just playing well. it too safe. Yeah, come on. <laughs> it's we're no pants. That's I, there's I, still some pants. I, I know it. I but it's still it's it's like the um, 
if, if we're talking about like how to grow on, on Instagram and yeah. like something like, how can you get people to talk about you? Right. Um, I love the, 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 the podcast you do with, um, uh, what's his name from Johnny Cupcakes. Mm -hmm. Um, like doing something that people will talk about that have like, like that's how you, how people will like, you'll get further and people will recommend you and, and they're like, oh, did you see this guy who did a time lapse of him drawing something in, in his underwear? Right. Like, <laughs> and at the beginning, I, I tried to make it um, because you always want to start the engagement on your post with, with like a lot of hype. So it, it, it has to take off strong. Otherwise, it, it, it might get lost in, in the algorithm, the magical algorithm that we're all so worried about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I did what I did. It was... I asked people like, oh, I, I kind of forgot to put on pants for this one and kind of like <laughs> make it look like a mistake until they oh, see the quote. Right. Um, and, and so so people were already like messaging me like, what, did you really forget it? And they're like laughing and oh, everything. And so I see. That, creates, that creates the oh, hype of you. like, oh, actually, I want to see that. Look and at you, you marketer, you. For, for my undies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting because you took a familiar phrase, which is home is where the heart is. You put one twist in it and you figured out how can you build interest in it. You can call it hype. You can call it whatever PR marketing. But there you are. You're really smart about this kind of stuff. Dang, I still hate you. All right. Let's see what else here. <laughs> right. I, it, it wasn't it wasn't my quote. I Pinterest helped a lot with okay. that one. Mm -hmm. Um, we we're doing a challenge for Lauren Hum and, and the challenge was like, all right, using a phrase that they, that everyone can use in the challenge, but that everyone can adapt. So this one is home is where, and then I'll ask people to, to use that, to, to mm. do something creative. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's kind of been the gist of it, but I've seen, I seen the home is where the pants aren't is, is I've seen that many times yeah. on, on Pinterest. Okay. And, and so I'm just making that. I got a couple of quick questions for you. So hopefully, because I'm, I'm looking at the time here, mindful of the time, we're, we're kind of at the hour mark here. So I, I want to get as many questions in as possible. So you have to do the Aaron Draplin challenges, which is the answer pretty quickly. Okay. I got a couple of quick Sweet. questions for you. How long did it take you to do that piece where home is where the pants are? Two and a half hours. Wow. Two and a half hours. And is that just chalk you're using or using one of those liquid chalk markers? Regular chalk. Regular chalk. God. It's a Crayola chalk. Mm. All right. <laughs> okay. The other piece where you were talking about together, you're breaking my heart here because yeah. I thought that was a real piece. I thought you're telling it was me to Photoshop, too. dude? That There's nothing awesome. real on the internet. <laughs> oh my God. Until I thought it was I like, wow. The, the feet in the shadows. Yes. I could tell on the lighting. It like, was painted in. He but, hired yeah. some tile making good. person and some artisan crafting this together. You're like, no, it's Photoshop, dude. Wow. That would be amazing. It would take a lot longer doing that in real life of than course. doing that on Photoshop. Definitely took me like, it took me like 19 hours to actually draw that. And then I, I hand clicked in the colors for every tile. Wow. So that's a lot of clicking. You're still breaking my heart, man. <laughs> okay. Matthew, you got some quick questions for him? Um, man, I don't know about Okay. Quick. I got one then. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how do you get clients? There we go. There it is. That that is a brilliant question and <laughs> i at the same time i still don't know exactly how i get clients um i'd love to tell you like these are the steps you have to take um and i'm get i'm not like i'm a faith person um so i believe in god and i i've had the the privilege that like i've dreamed a lot of big dreams like the the thing for coca-cola and at it across times square and, and last year just like it blew my mind. And, and for me, it's always been that I had an agent for a while. I had someone who was representing me and, and what I always got back from them was, you know what, we're trying, like we've reached out to clients and somehow like no one comes back and asks, like wants to work with you or it's, it's hard to say. It's like, I've had the most amazing opportunities to just drop into my inbox mm -hmm. and, and coming in. And, and at the same time, like there, there are a lot of things that I love to do and love to reach out to, for example, do like the chalk. Well, you could do so many fun, cool, uh, paid promotions with that. Like for my undies, would, that would have been great for my undies or even yeah. Levi's. Or, um, but there's like a quote that is, um, abs are great, but have you tried donuts? And so I have this picture of, <laughs> of me sitting at the bottom 
with like a Krispy Kreme or a or a donuts uh, box, and then having the whole room filled with donuts like uh, Scrooge McDuck kind of the style, mm-hmm. and and have that quote in the background. And so it's kind of like it's a great platform or a great way to advertise. But I've always had trouble to how to communicate that because if I did it, it's hard to do it again. If like if I write on a Samsung um, uh, luggage, like it's it's great if I get Samsung to to work with me, um, but it's hard to do that in advance before you've actually done it, and and so these are were like kind of difficult things that I had to to deal with, but like the the airport project, Coca Cola, um, Asics, and and all these companies, like it's usually been someone who's either been following me or or found me or been uh, recommended to, and and so on. But what I'm trying to do now strongly is is client retention. Like we've always heard that client retention is so much easier than client acquisition, and and talking about um, clients. Like I try to like like w- keep working with the the clients that I love to work with, and like for example, the project we are seeing now with um, Bombay Sapphire that was in Berlin. That was an amazing project. I worked with an amazing team, and and I just want to work with those people again. So so I like the people that I love to work with. Like I I'm gonna reach out to them and just offering my help and saying like, hey, how can I help you? Do whatever you need to do. Like if there's something that I can help you with, let me help you. I'm glad you and, asked. Uh, you could paint a mural at our place. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just messing around with you. Okay. So I like your attitude. Look, I want I want to pin you down a little bit here. People ask, how do you get clients? He's like, he gave us a long story about weird answers. Like, <laughs> maybe you're not aware of what it is that you're doing, but I'm picking up on your secret. What I've heard so far in two of the examples, or three of the examples that you gave, which is, I don't think you take Instagram like how most people take Instagram. I think you sit there and you think, like, what am I going to do that's going to get people to talk about? And you're conceptually designing it almost like an ad, an ad in a way that's really engaging. The way that you talked about donuts and, you know, abs are nice, but donuts are better or whatever it is that you said. And then you're thinking about how to frame that and shoot it. The same thing with your pants, how to create a little bit of fun controversy and the tiles on the floor and getting people involved in the community. It's almost like you're a social media marketing person who just so happens to be a pretty darn good hand lettering artist just on the side. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, Matthew? Yeah. Like he takes it seriously. And it, and so there's everybody that's out there and like, oh, there's all these young talentless like hacks out there and they're just <laughs> growing their thing. No, because they take it really seriously. Right. You basically just put the entire future team on notice right now. <laughs> L, I know you're watching this. <laughs> L, see the level in which people are raising to? Like that's how serious we have to. We have to think campaigns. Mm-hmm. So really, Stefan... I don't even know if this is your true calling. Maybe when you're back in Zurich, and maybe you and I talk a little bit, and it could be your coach or something, maybe you should sell the service of, I'm going to help you design campaigns, and we're going to charge you $250,000. And Uncle Chris will only take 10%. I'm very generous that way. And then you get to sit there and use that creative brain of yours to think, like, we'll we'll shoot it this way, and and you just art direct and creative direct the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I reach think, out to me afterwards i think stefan is the uh the johnny cupcakes of the hand lettering world sure. he is he's right. a master marketer <laughs> very very smart yes. very intelligent god i hate you <laughs> dang <laughs> unorthodox marketing over here yes right. well no it. actually it is orthodox marketing just applied to platforms where people just are too lazy to think about it that way right so these guys mm-hmm. especially stefan is just like really into it and he can figure this thing out dang i think you need to make a course and sell it on the future about how to be a master marketer on Insta Grizzle, let's just do it. <laughs> let's do it, right? Yeah, I got this. Like, yes, <laughs> this is great. And we'll we'll be sitting there at Scrooge McDuck counting the millions. Like, oh my gosh, this is so good. <laughs> 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 Woo! All right, Matthew, uh, it's almost time for us to end the show. I have my notes already, but I want to give you because you know the gentleman that I am, Matthew. I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask the last question. Oh, what is it going to be? Man, okay, you got um, it. I do. I, I mean, I we've unpacked a lot on this very short live stream, and I mm-hmm. think we've here at the end uncovered some of the genius behind the, some of the stuff that yes. you do. If you were to give advice for somebody who wants to start doing this, what one tip would you give them that would help them along the way? One tip. I want you to think about this one. Is it one good, solid, amazing, golden nugget right at the end here? It's 
it's actually a really, really simple one. And I wish Nike didn't steal it from me. No, they, they <laughs> didn't. <laughs> it's, it's really just do it. Like you're, we have so many excuses of doing something and mm -hmm. we're waiting for a sign from heaven to drop mm -hmm. to, to, to come. And, and like my, my quote is, or that I use a lot is create something today, even if it sucks. Because we, we wait till we are good or we, we have an excuse for everything. We have an excuse for not being perfect, for not having enough time for uh, all these things. And that's like, that's exactly what I, I uh, do at conferences. Like I try to tell people like, just do it, make it happen. Like, even if you have to write it on a toilet paper, like <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, there's no excuse. Like even so if you dirty. have to draw it on a toilet or, or wherever, <laughs> Just do it, and and I'm I'm the best example of where it can get you. Like if you just start, if you have no idea, if you have no degree, and and just do what you can. Over time, you'll get better. You'll get so good, and and so good that the world cannot ignore you anymore. And and so that's where, if you're waiting for something to happen, then you're just waiting and you're not doing. And if you're doing, then you can't imagine where it can bring you. Like. I never thought I would have a ad on Times Square, like I think like not in the next 10 years, but somehow it did happen and you never know what's like, what crazy things can happen. Van Tass. What a way to end it. Woo! <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah. I got the summary here. Here we go. Before we say goodbye to Stefan, here we go. Here's my summary. Summary. First of all, we've learned in a very short period of time, I think only a, sh a few years, barely a few years, Stefan's gone from doing client work and doing products and, and passive income and courses that has superseded his ability to even do client work. He also gets paid by doing IG posts because he's an influencer. He gets paid. He gets paid to speak, and now he's venturing into coaching. So if you guys want to reach out to Stefan after this, do so. He's a coach, and, you, and I'm going to tell you a couple other things that I learned. One is that he has a minimum. It's important to understand your minimum, regardless of how quickly he can get a job done. If a client's willing to pay him three thousand dollars for ten minutes of work, no problem. Just pay me the three grand. I'm good with that. I like that. And he's like, think about usage rights and negotiate for that. And it's got to feel right for you and the client. And so it's probably a conversation, but it's a way to tap into some higher billings, higher estimates that you can do. Ask a lot of questions to help define the scope of the project because that's when the scope can mushroom. And then therefore you, you need to think about the entirety of the project and can actually build more for it. Pricing is a bit of an art form. I think there's more to it, but his philosophy is if they say yes too quick, there's a good chance you're pricing too low. And if they give you that hard no, like, oh my God, forget about it. Maybe you went too high. And through asking questions, you're going to get a feeling for it. And if they have to push back a little bit, get approval, hem and haw a little bit, chances are you found the right price. You found the ceiling. And just as a good tip, sometimes you can just ask the clients, what's your budget for this? What have you spent historically for something like this? He could have asked the airport the same thing. And most people are very ethical and they will just tell you, last year we spent this. And then you can go from there. You can say, you yeah, know, that's a little low from what we just talked about. But at least you have a baseline. It's good to know. And uh, this is out of sequence, but he said, be so good the world can't ignore you. If we could all live by that philosophy, the world would be a beautiful place. Okay, next up, these are the funny notes I have. Be a bank teller so you can get used to taking people's money. <laughs> That's the job I wish I had, but I was busy being a stock boy at a supermarket. Not the proper training on how to be a business and, and a creative entrepreneur. Here's a business hack. I'm not saying he said it like this, but this is how I heard it. Ask another design firm to show you their bid so you can see how they structure their project and then copy it. <laughs> That's how he's doing it. That's a business hack right there. Just look at how other professionals are defining the engagement and see what you can learn from it. Here's the thing that I really, really learned. This is my one key takeaway is to treat your Instagram account like a creative challenge to get people to pay attention. Don't just like post something because it's convenient. Be creative and think about campaigns and how you can get engagement. And his last little bit of advice, of course, Nike stole way ahead of time is just do it. Stop thinking about it. Just go out there and make it. Stefan Kuntz was on the show. He is at typoxphoto.com. And you can also check him out on YouTube. He's got a channel here. I think 30 some odd thousand subscribers on his YouTube channel. And he makes tools for creative fools just like you. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I'm trying to rhyme, guys. Give me 
Give me a little slack here. This episode was brought to you by the typeface, well, hand lettering goodness by Stefan himself and Knockout. You guys, thanks very much for tuning in. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and hit that bell. We love you. Thank you for being a sustaining member. Peace, guys. See you later.